Hi, welcome back to the Rebel Podcast with Deborah Danielson. This is our third and final episode. And isn't it amazing how many of the life-changing and society-changing invention actually have occurred in a garage? Seriously. Now, you ask yourself, do you really take people's dreams seriously who are locked away, sometimes for years in their garage, as they work diligently in their home garage to realize a dream. Perhaps you laugh at their visions because they appear preposterous, hard to comprehend, or just completely unaffordable. So you dismiss these lofty people. The most successful society-changing inventions that happened in a home garage may change your mind about taking Dave Paris and Kyle Finley's quantum warp drive engine more seriously. So who are the inventors that have changed our lives by working out of their garage? Well, I just took a top five. So first of all, and most befittingly, the garage door opener was invented in a home garage in 1927 by C.G. Johnson. He had a very simple pulley system that used a chain to lift the garage door. It sounds very, very unattractive, but it was a major improvement over hand cranking the doors open. Now let's take the transistor. I'm especially proud of this because I used to work in the building in Homedale, New Jersey the home of the transistor that was introduced by the Bell Laboratories. The transistor was invented in 1947 by John Bardeen, Walter Bratton, and William Shockley in their Bell Labs garage. The transistor is a semiconductor device and it can amplify or switch electronic signals. Uses include a huge amount of electronic devices, oh, like our computers, oh, maybe radios and TVs, oh, definitely. Now let's take the personal computer. Thanks to Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, in 1975, the Apple computer was invented as a simple kit, do it yourself, for the buyer to assemble and use, but it revolutionized the personal computer revolution of the 1980s. Now let's look at the internet. The internet in 1989 became Tim Berners-Lee vision of how to help the world share and source information. The World Wide Web in his CERN office was the catalyst behind all of us being able on the World Wide Web to interlink hypertext documents that are accessed via the internet, of course, being able to share it with our friends, with our cohorts, with our educational system. It has transformed the world. And finally, What about the 3D printer? Chuck Hall invented the first one in 1984. Today we see it used in many industries that include manufacturing, aerospace, and medicine. I've even seen results of that where jewelry is made, earrings, where you can buy them on Etsy. Of course, these inventions have had a profound impact on our lives, and they continue to shape the world we live in. Yes, it is important to admit not all garage inventions are successful or meaningful. Many garage inventions will never make it to market or they cannot be made commercially successful. But what is vastly necessary for success is to get the right like-minded people in the room for a hands-on demonstration, develop and incorporate problem-solving solutions and to secure 
visionary funding, those angel investors, that can transform the prototype into a monetizing product that benefits society. The question I put to you now, as you watch this final episode and we see the full breadth of what Dave Paris and Kyle Finley have been working on with their QED, and as you go to their website and check it out and watch everything that they've developed invented and engineered in that garage laboratory, have they earned a seat at the table with like-minded angel investors that will transform the world should their invention be selected? Should they get the funding from the expert angel investors and will they be allowed to transform our travel our society, and the way we look at UAPs? And are those UAPs really us? Bending time. You be the judge. I can't wait to hear from you. Thank you for watching. And now, beam me up, Scotty. This is the one that was... Uh demonstrated that no matter what happens, it'll still work. <laughs> that was pretty cool. I gotta say, I'm really impressed at the design and how cool all of this stuff is. Um, well, it was much more complicated. The, uh, the other engines are up here. We got smaller variants. We have uh, slidable uh, variants. We can change aspects of the arrays inside of the motors we found we can generate even more power by shifting off the uh, the arrays off axis and uh, we're in the process of um, actually building brand new engines and these engines are going to be clustered so that we can um, produce multiple warp bubbles in a confined area so this is this is one of the engines in process right now yep mm-hmm and when you get all of this put together, is it going to resemble something like a, um, oh, for lack of anything other to compare it to, like a solar panel? No, no. Uh, actually, the, the engines themselves are independent. Mm -hmm. And they would be placed on the spacecraft, on the wingtips, on the uh, forward cockpit or above the cockpit below the spacecraft uh, you can put them in all different kinds of configurations I see so they don't depend on light oh no no right not, not so it's it's they, these it, will work in a vacuum as well in a vacuum Wow so this is really really it's, it's technology at a breakthrough point in history and it's uh, simple it's very simple once once everything was figured out, it's simple. Mm -hmm. um, the complicated parts of it, generating the field, mixing the field, bringing the thing up, uh, working the throttle controls, you just can't slam the throttle down. Everything is incremental uh, in a way uh, to bring power up and then to sustain it. But I'll tell you, once you hit threshold of power, you know, on the um, a video that we shot, and you can see the, the uh, needle on the scale, mm -hmm. just in 18 seconds, it's a constant acceleration. It's an accumulative acceleration. And then that's why when we talk about going to Mars in less than 16 days, mm -hmm. with just what we have here today, that engine sitting right there. Mm -hmm. Um, it's isn't that something to think that that's the engine that you could take to go into space? Yeah, it is, and it's right here in your garage. And we use very simple measurement uh, techniques. It's nothing expensive. We don't use sophisticated laser measuring systems. We use a ruler. And you know what? I think that's probably what the ancient Egyptians did. <laughs> that we can't figure out how they did those pyramids. <laughs>
We use simple tools. Yeah. And simple measurement tools, stopwatches, clocks, and uh, that to measure the So this, this is one of the stopwatches that you use that had to be manual. Yes. It kind of remo reminds me of Somewhere in Time, <laughs> a movie. <laughs> And well, we yeah, also, I've often heard, you know, especially around that Bermuda Triangle. We also use this, and we set different timing coefficients on here to um, exercise the system. Mm -hmm. We have uh, video cameras that then, then display the meters up here on this screen. Uh, our power supplies down here, our exciter over here, and this is what we shoot into the linear amplifiers over there. This is the actual uh, throttle control system. And then we energize and we will then advance the throttle and we'll go up to max capability for this particular configuration. We have low power settings, we have high power settings. And I usually do everything very uh, manually. Mm -hmm. However, we also have software that will engage the system, turn it on, turn it off, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know, 20,000 lines of code. Wow. Um, to make, to have this uh, computer software interface. But really 20,000 lines isn't that bad no. for what you're trying to do. It's actually pretty reasonable. Yeah, it is. Uh, it took me about a year or so to write it. Mm -hmm. um, and then but, you have to go through and test it and prove it. And, well, sure. And, yeah. But, on a day-to-day -day basis when we're testing all these different engines out uh, this is the control <laughs> it's a momentary switch and we look at this we look at all the meters we uh, judge what's going on if something's going wrong then it's an immediate release and we save the system yeah uh, there's so much money that's tied up into this uh, system here that we can't afford I have a very very limited budget of um, just a few thousand dollars. So over. if you I'll needed, you around. if you needed, if you could put out there for crowdfunding or let's put it out there to our audience, how much would you look at for someone to invest to help you get to where you need to be? Well, I, I could base on what we submitted to NASA. Our proposal was $25 million for five years, five million a year for five years. They flew into a thunderstorm which has 10 to the 15th watts of power mm -hmm. in, a, in a, a typical thunderstorm that these pilots have encountered. And uh, how do I reenact that? Do I get two huge radio towers, fly an airplane between it? Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't an answer. It wasn't right. sufficient. I mean, of course, it caught my imagination, but it's not practical. Right. So, so then I looked at taking the thunderstorm and reducing it into how can I compress those antennas that showed that discrepancy in a laser beam. But it was like a detective story. Yeah. And that's what was really fascinating. It took um, close to 50 years to figure this out. Wow. From my early encounters, seeing a UFO in the sky over upstate New York. It's all documented. I've produced all of the uh, various uh, topo maps and the pictures and a whole bit. Anyway, from that encounter of seeing it, I wanted to replicate it. And later on in life, some 40 years later, uh, I then started to read about Bruce Gernon's encounter. And then the other uh, disciplines that I've been involved with, electronics and software, all started to come into play here in order to figure this out. Now. Right up until I did figure this out, it was a great mystery. And then, as I began to see evidence that of the Alcubierre concept, it then became clear at that point that I could replicate artificially what happened to these pilots. Uh, Bluebird, well, this will be our test module to actually adhere, uh, put engines onto and lift the craft up. And what do you call this? It's called Bluebird 2. Bluebird. So this is an aluminum yes. actual aircraft. It's not a prototype. It's it's a real aircraft that you're going to use. Correct. And, and, and you're going to put on the wings some of the engines that we've seen today? Yeah. 
we'll have pods on the wings and we'll have a pod over the cockpit. Yeah. And uh, right now, this is on a vertical extraction jig. So how long have you been working on this um, aircraft? <clears throat> this uh, original design was made back in 1991. Okay. And, uh, you can actually put the wing at a 45 degree angle and still have laminar flow come over the wing. It has positive dihedral built into the craft. If, you, if we reversed on the other side, you'll see it in the model. But kind of like a butterfly, if, mm -hmm. you, if you've seen butterflies uh, mm -hmm. fly, they, if, uh, when they spread their wings out flat, they're very unstable. But as soon as they put a small V into their wing structure, straight level. It stabilizes level it. Yeah. And that adds to the stability of the craft. Now, electrically speaking, the backup is that there would be Kevlar over the wings for like a mini heat shield. Mm -hmm. uh, but we never intend to use it because the idea is to take the craft and go up like an elevator mm -hmm. and come back down like an elevator. Our ultimate goal is to develop, and all of these engines are scalable. I, you may have seen our small ones of this size that we will use for anti-gravity, for, for, uh, for positive, for artificial gravity, mm -hmm. and we've scaled them up to over two feet. And we can make them even bigger than that. The idea here is to be able to lift from the surface of the earth, eliminate all rocket boosters with their chemical, solid propellant right and instead of costing twelve thousand five hundred like uh spacex can charge now nasa it still cost them like thirty thousand in the past mm -hmm. uh i want to be able to take this from the ground up like an elevator go up and down all day long like a buck and a half two dollars a pound that's the ultimate goal mm -hmm. so it could very much benefit telecom communications oh everything it could very much help with medicine but the big thing that i think probably the governments are worried about is warfare and using things to attack people from an aerial position don't you think well yes does this have potential of creating uh, an imbalance of, uh, well, you have this, and I'm now in fear of you, I'm going to attack you. Not yeah. for evil. I think people, our government has to be able to control it so that it's not misused. And they talk about their, you know, the environmental impact of all of our carbon-based fuels we're using. Well, we and if they would look at some of this, there's a huge differentiator, right? Well, there's been some diversion to go to electric-powered commuter aircraft right now. Mm -hmm. The Israelis have a small commuter airliner that uh, they can handle up to, I think, 13, 14 people, mm -hmm. and it's run on electric. However, if you eliminate the, uh, the drain on the fuel for that aircraft use, and you go to electric and you go to getting from point A to B relatively quickly, spanning the Atlantic in just a few seconds would be highly practical, probable, and in the future to do this, which means you could live anywhere you wanted on the face of the earth, uh, to your mountain lair, to live in Antarctica and work in New York City. I think our initial experiments could be done within the next five years to 10 years to actually run a craft to Pluto mm -hmm. to out of the solar system within a very reasonable time, within just a few months. Right, I do too, and it's exciting. So more to come. Yeah. And I think nothing could be more real than where you guys are and what you're doing, right? No. Because you're always looking at the sky. You're always thinking about how things work. You're always saying, is that possible? Is it plausible? Right. Is it replicatable, right? Mm, correct. So let's, let me ask you, I heard a rumor that there's about to be a new show coming on, um, the History Channel. And they, as you know, they've been doing a lot of stuff on aliens, They've been doing a lot of stuff about how were the 
old pyramids from Egypt built? How did we get all these big stones from Stonehenge on all Easter Island and over here and over there, you know? And then they use LIDAR now and they look at the Stonehenge under the water in like Michigan. I mean, it's just one thing after the other and they're trying to push very heavily on UAPs. This has to do with warp drive, quantum warp drive. In other words, he thinks it's really us mm -hmm. at a future time, warping time, bending time. Mm -hmm. Now, I need you guys to talk to me about that. What? For, because I got two experts here, right? <laughs> Tell me, and I'm hitting you cold, and I know you didn't have time to discuss this. Oh, no, no, we got plenty of time. I, I got to trigger Dave here with the time. <laughs> The time travel <laughs> aspect. We get asked that all the time, you know, different people. Oh, I believe time Are you doing travel. time travel? Are you doing this yeah. kind of stuff? But we, we kind of veer away from that. This isn't time travel in any sense. You know, there's yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of different things, you know, zero point energy, time travel, wormholes, you know, a lot of fringe science stuff, which we think, are, you know, that might be fringe, you know, we don't know anything about that, but the, the space warp is different than all that kind of stuff right. together. So right. what we do is, yeah, it's completely separate. Although we always, it's no provable. matter how many... What you do is scientifically provable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and to, uh, to be very specific, quantifiable and repeatable. Correct. It's not a one-time deal that we have results. Not a pipe dream. No, it's consistent. And we can operate in temperatures of 130 degrees which we do in the lab on some extremely yeah, hot 130 days. degrees out the other day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we get the same results as if we're out there and it's 20 below zero. Wow. So there really ain't any difference of the performance of the engines other than, you know, we're either trying to keep the equipment warm or we're trying to keep the equipment cool, but the results of the motor are always the same. Which is awesome. Yeah. Because it, when you can replicate it and you can have something that nobody else has, so you're unique, then you have a business proposition. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, right? You well, have you have something that you can make money on and patent or put into good use if we can find the right people to talk to in business development. And, yeah. and it also answers the question of how UAPs or UFOs, no why everybody shies away from UFO. Only because we're UFO guys, we're not uh, UAP. <laughs> I know. It's it's the nicer. It, it's kind of like um, the nicer pronunciation of Uranus, Uranus. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's the same. It, it's like no it's diff society, there's right? no difference between this. If you say UAP, you're not crazy. If you say UFO, you're a loon. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and so, I feel bad for pilots all these years, Delta. All these people, right? They've I mean, all been told to shut up. I have sat next to, I don't know how many pilots, you know, over the last 35 years. And the pilots are very, very hesitant to tell you what they've gone through. Mm. Because they don't want to lose their job. They don't want to be put in a psych ward. Yeah, and right. they don't want to lose their reputation. Right. So just say you saw a UFO and you're already disqualified from anything in the world. You know what I mean? It's like, but UAP is okay now. So. Yeah. <laughs> I saw, and I guess you're I saw not, UAP just the other day. I know you're not being discriminatory when you're using UAP like you are when you <laughs> use UFO. Well, we, we submitted our paper before, you know, I think it was the first time, 2014 or something. 13. Yeah. Yeah. And we use space warp engine, right? Because we were doing space warp engine. Everything points to space warp. We're doing it. We have the science to prove it. And they, they threw it out. But then we switched it to, well, we have a VEM drive and we're, you know, bending the fabric of space, you know, time right. combined. And it's like, oh, okay, now, we're, now we'll publish your paper. So it's, yeah, there's a society, you know, yeah. barrier there. We don't get, you know, it is what it is. We're doing, we have the results to prove it. We don't care what it, you know, what society wants to call it, you know, and that's kind of the same with the UFO, UAP kind of, you know, thing. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So what we can demonstrate is the capability of what these craft are doing, because we emulate the same thing. And you've seen this. You have experienced a UFO. Thank you so much, you guys, for being generous with your time and being on the Rebel Podcast today.
Watch the Rebel Podcast on KPAO Channel 22 on Cox Cable or on Apple TV, Roku, and YouTube at Deborah Danielson 5031. May the Force be with you. Like, subscribe, and share. Thank you for watching.